part of the Great Connector series. We've been doing these for, well, since COVID's been on. Uh, except this is our first in person. We've not had any presenters actually on the walkway for the last 18 months. So this is our first in person. And um, this will be on YouTube so you can find the link and share it with other people. Every month we have something um, presented that's connected to the walkway or Ulster or Dutchess County. So today we have a very special friend of mine. His name is Donald Fraser. And he has a very nice Scottish name, just like my accent, as you can hear. And we've known each other for a long, long time. Uh, Fraser is the educator from Mills Mansion. And if you haven't visited Mills Mansion, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's up in Statsburg, north of here. Other side of the river and north. So if you haven't visited, it's well worth a visit. Um, Donald is uh, the educator there, and he organises all programmes. He creates education programs for second graders right through college. And he has very special programs that uh, Mills seem to do a lot of. Uh, Tales of the Titanic, Gilded Age Scandals, World War I, and the End of the Gilded Age, and a Life in Service. Servants in the Gilded Age. So, um, get comfortable with some kind bars over here that if you're hungry, you can help yourself. And I'll hand this over to Fraser and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shirley. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, Shirley said, I'm Don Fraser. I work at Statsburg, which is a big mansion just up the river. Have some of you, some of you been? No, we're going to Oh, fantastic, yeah. Uh, the tours are probably sold out. Uh, you can look online and, uh, or give them a call, but the grounds are open and the okay. grounds are beautiful. Uh, the grounds are open every day, dawn to dusk. So my presentation today is called A Life in Service. You know, one of the most outstanding characteristics of the Hudson River is that its banks are dotted with historic mansions. And those mansions were owned by people whose names are famous in American history. The Rockefellers and the Roosevelts, the Vanderbilts and the Astors, uh, Jay Golds, J.P. Morgan. And in this area, the Livingstons, who were the great Hudson River aristocracy in the mid-Hudson Valley. But what about the people who worked in those estates, whose names are not famous, but are very much a part of our American story? Let's talk about them today. Now, what I know best is Statsburg, the place that I work. And so I'll base my talk around Statsburg. But learning about servants at Statsburg, you can easily imagine what servant life was like at smaller Hudson River estates like Wilderstein in Rhinebeck, or even larger Hudson River estates, even larger than Statsburg. Well, I have to admit that is not actually a Hudson River estate. That is Highclere Castle in England, the setting of Downton Abbey. And you know, if you're going to attend a talk on servants, you might as well expect that somebody's going to drag Downton Abbey into it somewhere. Some of you watched Downton Abbey? And for those of you who didn't, I'll try not to belabor the Downton Abbey angle for the whole talk, but for those of you who did watch Downton Abbey, didn't it bring the servants to life? You know, didn't it make you care about the servants? Well, I want to go back to a very specific moment in time. I want to go back to the spring and summer of 1896. 125 years ago. Now, in 1896, at Ruth and Ogden Mills' fabulous mansion in Statsburg, Catherine Harper, the Mills' Irish housekeeper, was hiring maids. And in 1896, the Mills' English butler, Frederick Thompson, was hiring footmen. Well, why? Why specifically? In the spring of 1896, were they hiring? 
You see, Mrs. Oh, were you going to venture an answer? Yes, please. You're very good. And have you been? To, no. You are just using your smarts. Right. Well, Mrs. Mills had put a little addition onto her house. Ruth Mills grew up at Statsburg in the 1850s and the 1860s. And when she grew up there, it was a 25-room mansion built by her great-grandfather, the former governor of New York. But you see, Ruth Mills, she wanted to be the queen of New York society. And you know, when you want to be the queen, 25 rooms, it's just not enough. So she hired Stanford White, one of America's most renowned architects, to expand her childhood home. And when Stanford White was finished in 1896, he had expanded Statsburg from 25 rooms to 79 rooms. That's a 200% increase. There's something like 55 more rooms. What's it mean for Catherine Harper, the housekeeper? There's a lot more rooms to clean. She's going to need more maids. What's it mean for Frederick Thompson, the butler? There's 55 more rooms. There's going to be more guests. They're going to be staying for dinner. He's going to need more footmen to wait on the servants. Help wanted in 1896. Where are you going to find employees? Well, at the turn of the century, it was the age of immigration. People were flooding into the United States from all over the world searching for a better life. So say you're an immigrant right off the boat at the turn of the century. Can you, can, can you come up the Hudson Valley and find work? Well, yes, you can. You can come to these great estates and find jobs because the great estates were like factory towns. They needed lots and lots of help. The American rich in the Gilded Age were modeling themselves on the European aristocracy. They considered themselves American aristocrats. So they were building huge mansions on vast tracts of land, and they were stocking up those mansions with huge numbers of servants. Well, how many servants? You know, at a place like Statsburg, you had the maids and the footmen, maybe six or eight maids, six or eight footmen, and the butler and the housekeeper. But there was also the chef and his under chefs and the kitchen staff of kitchen maids and scullery maids. And the Mills has had their own pastry chef, which I think is a great idea. And don't we all need a pastry chef? And then there's the people just doing general work, like shoveling coal into the furnaces. And what about outside? All these estates had vast lawns to mow, and they had plantings, and they had beautiful gardens and greenhouse complexes, and almost all of them had their own farm. And all these rich millionaires had a yacht on the Hudson River. And everybody's a specialist. You don't say to the captain of the yacht, hey, come on, we're going to mow the lawn. So inside the house, you might have something like two dozen people working. Outside the house, 40, 50, you know, something like that, more or less, depending on the size of the estate. Now, the maids that Catherine Harper is hiring at the turn of the century, she's hiring maids at the zenith of the age of servants. At the turn of the century, there were more servants in Great Britain than there were any other occupation. There were more servants than there were farmers. There were more servants than there were factory workers. But those maids that Catherine Harper hires in 1896, they're the last generation. Before they retire, they're going to see this world disappear. A perfect storm of change will come early in the 20th century that will largely eliminate the world at the great estates. Yeah, sure, in the 1930s, there's still going to be some rich people and there's still going to be servants, but it's a tiny minority. Uh, there, there was an English duke who grew up at the turn of the century 
And he said that inside the house, just inside the house, there were something like 36 servants. And then outside, an army. By the time he died in the 1970s, he had two servants, a husband and a wife. But what happened to them? Where'd they all go? Well, we'll talk about that. Uh, I wonder if you guys will indulge me in a little flight of fancy here. I, I found this picture of a maid, and I don't know who she is, but I fell in love with the picture. Look at that personality. Right? Look at that strength of character. She's going to go somewhere. So again, I don't know who she is, but I'm going to make up a name for her. I'm going to make her the heroine of my story. I'm going to say she's a, a, an Irish woman coming to look for work in the United States. I'll give her an Irish name. I'll call her Katie. I'll call her Katie O'Sullivan. All right. So Katie O'Sullivan is going to immigrate from Ireland. Uh, she's going to leave her parents behind in the old country. And she's going to come to look for work in the United States. Now, as an Irish woman, as part of the, one of the uh, first and largest immigrant groups to come to the United States, she may well face prejudice when she's looking for work. Can she get a job at Statsburg? Yes. Because why? Because who's doing the hiring? Catherine Harper, the Irish housekeeper. So she's going to hire her homegirl. Now, I, I, I want to go on a tangent a little bit. What if you're black and you're applying for work at the turn of the century in one of these great estates? Might you face prejudice? My colleague, Zachary Veith, has recently done research with the turn of the century census. And he sees there were no black servants at Statsburg at the turn of the century. And there's a certain uh, irony because one of the mill's employees, their farm superintendent, had a black servant. And there's a further irony because Ruth Mill's ancestors were served by black servants who were held in slavery at Statsburg before emancipation in New York in the 1820s and 1830s. So there are black servants at Statsburg held in slavery in the 1820s and 1830s. But by the turn of the century, the census shows there are no black servants at Statsburg. But there were definitely black servants in the Gilded Age. Might you face prejudice if you're applying for jobs um, in these Gilded Age mansions and you're black or Hispanic or Asian or Eastern European? Yeah, likely you would. You might run into these bizarre ethnic prejudices uh, that were widely shared in these turn of the century mansions. Prejudices that said, well, uh, people from the British Isle, they make good maids, and let's have an English butler because they're so distinguished. And the Swedes, they're so clean. Let's hire Swedish laundry maids. You know, it, it's wacko stuff. Uh -huh. uh, but Katie, our Irish maid, she can get a job at Statsburg. Now, here's the next question. She can get a job at Statsburg. Do we want her to get a job at Statsburg? Is being a maid at a Hudson River estate at the turn of the century, is it a good job? Well, when I started researching turn of the century servants, I discovered there's a a whole genre of paintings of servants sleeping. At the turn of the century, if you got a job as a maid, your work day was typically 16 or 17 hours a day. The work week was six and a half days a week. And I dare say that the minute you stopped moving, you fell asleep. So here I am, I'm doing this research, and I see painting after painting of servants sleeping. It must have been a common sight. And not just at the turn of the century. 1600s, 1700s. Let's throw a footman in for gender balance. Well, what else about the job? This is a picture of the maids' quarters in a museum called the Merchant House in New York City. 
And uh, you see two maids crowded into a little room, this kind of cast off furniture. Um, so your living conditions are not great. But if you're a maid at the turn of the century, say you're an immigrant, you're living in a lousy attic room in a mansion, still, maybe better than living in a rat infested slum tenement in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. You know, if you're a maid working a 16 hour day in a mansion, maybe it's better than working in a dangerous sweatshop like this poor girl who can't even afford to have shoes. The Millses paid their servants a decent wage. They were able to save money. They got free room and board. And in mansions teeming with rich food, maybe starving immigrants ate better than they had ever eaten in their lives. Now, it's the zenith of the age of servants. All of this is going to go away in one generation. When my imaginary Katie is old enough to retire, let's say after the Depression in the 1930s, it's largely going to be gone. Let's look at a day in the life of a servant in a Hudson River estate, and then we'll talk about why. Why did it all go away? And before I go on, you see how boring it is if I just do all the talking? So maybe you guys have questions at this point? I can't understand it. <laughs> we need a, a translator. But I'll stop again. Um, and if you have questions, just you know, raise your hand like you did. Now, servant starts the morning in their bedroom, right? And this is a picture of uh, a footman's bedroom at Statsburg, where I work. And you see, it's not too shabby. That's quality oak furniture. And tucked away on the right-hand wall, there's a radiator. So you say it's a nice light room, big window, there's electric light, you've got a radiator. Look right at the foot of the bed, and what do you see? It's a chamber pot, right? So the Millses had indoor plumbing. The footman had a bathroom. Just one bathroom for eight footmen. The maids had a bathroom. One bathroom for eight maids. So you can imagine the competition for the bathroom. It's like if you have eight kids and they're all getting up at the same time, getting ready for school. And these people had all grown up with chamber pots. So they, I'm sure, were very happy to use a chamber pot if they couldn't get to the bathroom. Now, it's a servant's room. It's a footman's room. Who do you think cleans the servant's room? It's a footman. He's a servant. He can clean his own room. No, 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 no. Now it's time to introduce a primary concept in servant life, status. Just like there's status upstairs, there's status downstairs. Who cleans the footman's room? A maid. Because the footmen have higher status than the maids. And who cleans the maid's room? A lower status maid. Young kids, maybe as young as 11 or 12 years old, were hired in mansions. <laughs> right? And they got the lousy jobs. Uh, a, a young lady like this was called a tweenie. She's between. She's not a maid yet. Uh, and, you know, we look at horror w with the idea of a 12-year-old having to go to work. And you could balance it at the turn of the century with the idea that the kids might be starving at home. And if they're starving at home and they get a job in a mansion, they're going to eat well, they're going to have a warm place to stay, and they're going to learn a trade. The tweenie is going to learn to be a maid. And the male equivalent was called a hall boy. And the hall boy is going to learn to be a footman. You know, we don't want to see child labor, but for some of these kids, it might have meant getting a few square meals. Now, this is a maid, maid's room at Staxburg. And again, you see this quality oak furniture. Not too bad. Uh, I have another question. 
Any room for a husband or kids in that room? No, no. I mean, it's nicer than at the merchant house, but still, no room for a husband, no room for kids. Hey, maid, you're supposed to be working 16 hours a day. When are you going to have time to look after your kids? So if you get a job as a maid, you desperately need a job. You get a job as a maid. And what about my imaginary Katie O'Sullivan? Well, we want her to meet a nice fella, right? And maybe get married and have kids. Might have to quit your job. No room there for the kids. Sorry, Katie. Well, uh, uh, now Katie, she gets up in the morning in the servant's room. And of course, the first thing she does is get dressed. She gets dressed in the uniform. This is a key part of this whole Gilded Age scene. Heaven forbid that you as a guest walk in and you don't know who the servants are and you don't know who the other guests are because they're dressed the same. Oh, no, 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 we can't have that. You know, I look at uh, pictures of servants in the early Victorian age or in the 1700s and I don't see the maids wearing uniforms. They're not dressed as nicely as the ladies of the house. But I think the, my uneducated guess is that the uniform thing comes with this later Victorian and Edwardian sort of nose up in the air thing of status, where we can't have any mistakes between who the maids are and who the guests are. Now, Katie gets up in a room, she puts on her uniform, and she's facing a 16-hour day, you probably want a good breakfast, right? You're going to need some calories to get you through the day. You want breakfast? I say, no, no, we're not having breakfast. No, you have a lot of work to do before breakfast because the entire house has got to be spotlessly clean before the guests get up. There was an English duke who said he would fire any maid he saw after 12 noon. They're all supposed to do the work invisibly. It's supposed to, to the guest's eyes, it happens by magic. So grab your carpet beater because you got a lot of work to do before the guests get up. And the rooms that you've got to clean in these Gilded Age mansions, what kind of rooms are we talking about? And rooms like this. And like this, you know, how would you like to clean your room, uh, clean this room? Well, uh, there's an enemy in all these rooms lurking. The enemy of the Gilded Age maid. What is it? Coal. Coal. All those vast rooms were covered in coal dust. All those big mansions were heated with coal furnaces. The atmosphere of the Gilded Age was an atmosphere of coal smoke. Now at Statsburg, where I work, there has not been a coal furnace probably since World War II. But to this day, everything is covered with a fine layer of coal dust. So here's the turn of the century made. She's got these vast rooms to clean. Uh, we need to help her out. So what are we going to do? She can put away her carpet beater because we're going to invent labor-saving devices. Let's invent the vacuum cleaner. You know, w would you rather take a huge Persian rug out of the house, hang it up on a line, beat it with this carpet beater, or vacuum? We're going to help them out at the turn of the century, make life a little bit easier. And here's another invention. Uh, that you, might not strike you right away, but it, it was a, a major change. You know, those irons, before you invent the electric iron, you've got to heat your irons on the stove. So winter and summer, the maids doing the ironing are standing next to a huge stove with the irons lined up on it. As soon as the iron starts to cool, you've got to put it back on the stove, grab another one. And those things are heavy. They used to call them sad irons, S-A-D, I think because the job was so hard. Uh, one of the best pieces of historical writing that I have ever read is in 
Robert Caro's book, C-A-R-O, Robert Caro's biography of Lyndon Johnson. And he writes a, a chapter about what it meant to bring electricity into rural America. And he, he, a big part of the chapter is about those sad irons and what a brutal job it was. And once you invent the electric iron, then you put a smile on the maid's face. And look, look how early this is. It, it, you can vaguely make out, uh, look at the electric light, that the iron is just screwed right into the light socket. There's no plugs yet, right? And what about electric lights? What did that mean for the maids? All right, right before you have electric lights, you've got gas lights, and that probably wasn't too bad. But before that, you've got kerosene lamps and oil lamps, which means that in order to light these big mansions, the maids are running around all day long, filling up lamps and trimming the wicks and cleaning the chimneys, which are constantly smoking. So it must have been a nightmare just to light the mansion. And come Thomas Edison, all you got to do is flick the switch. Thank you, Mr. Edison. Now, the entire house cleaned, Katie can finally get her breakfast. And here's a picture of servants eating. It says uh, servants hall dinner, but I'm going to say it's breakfast. It's a picture of servants eating, but it is also a picture of servants' status. How do they sit in the servants' hall? They sit in order of status. So the gentleman with his back to us sitting at the head of the table, that's the butler. And in the position of honor on his right, that's the housekeeper. She's the second most powerful person. And then in descending order from the housekeeper, you see two ladies dressed in black. They are the ladies' maids. They are the personal servants of the ladies of the house. Below them are the maids, lower status. And to the butler's left, two gentlemen in tailcoats who are the equivalent of the ladies' maids. Those are the valets. Those are the gentlemen's personal servants. And then sitting below them the, are the young footmen in the footman's uniform. And you know, you saw it in Downton Abbey. They never said it. But you saw it nonetheless. Where did they sit? Right? The butler, Mr. Carson, always at the head of the table. And who's at his right? Mrs. Hughes, the housekeeper. Now, unlike th the uh, drawing I showed you, Downton Abbey, they didn't sit men and women uh, women on one side, men on the other. But nonetheless, it's status. Who's sitting below that uh, uh, on Carson's left, the butler's left? That's the lady's maid. And then you had the valets. Right? Uh, look in the right-hand side, and you see the three ladies. That's the kitchen staff. Kitchen staff don't eat there. Kitchen staff eat in the kitchen. Now, questions I might answer. I've shocked you all into a stunned silence. <laughs> OK, just stop me any time, because uh, once I get on a roll, as you can see. Let me just get a drink of water. Eric's question was, <clears throat> uh, he's familiar with the Mills place where I work. <coughs> and there was a big uh, farm operation across the street. And uh, to what extent were staff shared? And, and we think there's no staff sharing. The farm staff was a completely separate staff. You know, the house staff would live in the house. The farm staff probably lived in the village, except for the superintendent who had his own house and his own servants. Uh, but uh, that's where people from the village could get jobs, on the grounds and on the farm. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, it, did bring, it did bring the community in. So yes, together. absolutely, right. You've got your immigrants coming in. And uh, again, my colleague, Zach, who did research, said uh, the census information supports it. You've got Irish maids at the house. But your local folks, too, are getting jobs on the mansion. Yeah. And Mrs. Mills knows if, she, if she's throwing a big party, she knows there's certain men in the village 
that she can bring in as extra footmen. Guests. You know, Mrs. Mills' house was a party house. So there uh, were guests staying all the time. They had fabulous, beautiful guest rooms like you see here. Who takes care of the guest rooms? Well, it's the chambermaids. Chambermaids take care of all the bedrooms. And I was really happy when I found this picture because it tells the story I want to tell. It's got two little elements in it that I want to talk about. One is, you see the, the lady on the left has this little watering can? Well, what's that for? Is she watering plants? No, no, no. Before indoor plumbing, how did you get hot water up to the bathtubs for the guests? Well, you'd heat the water on the stove, and then it would come up in these cans. And when I say come up, I mean it would come upstairs, lots and lots of stairs. At Statsburg, where I work, between the kitchen level and the first level of bedrooms, there's a good 50 stairs. So I, I, I'm going to guess, what, what do you think about that can? Two or three gallons, maybe? How many gallons does it take to fill up a bathtub? I mean, modern, modern bathtub, 50 gallons, right? But they had smaller bathtubs, you know, before indoor plumbing. Uh, but water is about eight pounds a gallon. Say that's three gallons, that's 24 pounds. She's gonna walk that up 50 odd stairs how many times before that bathtub gets filled? So the bathtubs are a little smaller. You, you had these hip baths, but still, you know, they're not tiny. What does it mean for the maids when you invent indoor plumbing? Oh, somebody was mentioning the breakers, right? Were you guys at the breakers? Yeah. You can turn on the tap and fill up the bathtub. Now, there's still plenty of work for the maids, right? You've got to clean the bathtub. You have to change all the towels. You have to dry off the soap between guests. And here's the subject that is all, almost too horrible to talk about, but we've got to talk about it because I think it is the essence of the owner-servant relationship, the chamber pot. Think of these big mansions before indoor plumbing, filled with guests, other servants, family members, under every bed is a chamber pot. And in the morning, the maids have to go around and collect the chamber pots, dump them out, scour them so they're clean and fresh, and return them. What did it mean for the maids when they invented indoor plumbing? Ma'am, I, I wish I could have a photograph of the look that you gave and I, I would put it in the presentation. That's what I'm trying to say. You just said it all. And I bet you they didn't have gloves then either. Yeah, any rubber gloves? No, no, no. Well, now the guests are finally going to arise, have a nice breakfast, and then they've got a busy day ahead of them. They're at the country house at Statsburg, so they're going to be playing tennis and golf at the Mills' private golf course across the street. They'll be out on the yacht. And then the big deal is at nighttime when you have a very formal dinner. Now, there may be a hidden agenda beneath all these Gilded Age visits to the country houses, and it's an agenda that you see over and over again in Gilded Age novels, like the novels of Edith Wharton. What's the agenda? Love and marriage. The tiny caption underneath says, the greatest game in the world, his move. Well, look, you're a rich parent, and you want your child to meet some other rich kid because you don't want your rich kid marrying some poor kid. You want to keep all the money together. And what better place than these country house parties where everyone, the young folks are well chaperoned, and you can pair up your rich kid with some other rich kid. And at one time, the Mills had three eligible Kids, almost the same age. They had twin daughters and a son who was only two years younger. So imagine Statsburg filled with all these other rich folks. 
They're all coming and trying to make, uh, trying to make the matches. Now, I, I would like to look at this with somewhat of a, of a jaundiced eye. I would like to look at it through Katie's eyes. All right, all these rich people, they're arriving at this fabulous party and uh, you know, they're going out on the yacht and young folks are flirting. Who makes all this possible? Who is working their fingers to the bone to provide this perfect setting for love and romance? The servants, right? Well, how about Katie? Don't we want Katie to meet some nice young fella? But you see, Katie's not supposed to meet some nice young fella because when you apply for a job as a maid in the Gilded Age, you are likely to find ads that say, no followers allowed. What's a follower? A follower is a gentleman caller. Right? A follower is a potential boyfriend. Hey, uh, I want my maid working 16 hours a day. I don't want some young guy hanging out at the kitchen door waiting for the five minutes when she's got a chance to have a cup of tea. She's got to be on call. And if things go well and she gets married, I'm going to lose my maid. So you get hired under this condition. No followers allowed. Now, look. Katie is not a slave, right? She does have a half day off. Right? She's got to work six and a half days a week. But she does have the half day off. So maybe Katie, on her half day off, she wants to leave Statsburg and go into Poughkeepsie. Maybe she meet a nice fellow in Poughkeepsie. So on her half day off, she can take off her uniform and put on some nice civilian clothes. And she could take the train into Poughkeepsie and maybe go to the Bardavon, what they call the opera house at the turn of the century. It wasn't the Bardavon, it was uh, something else. Uh, your homework. <laughs> or, you know, where uh, Marist is. There was this big amusement park at the turn of the century. So Katie's going to get dressed in her best and she's going to go out and maybe hope to meet a young fella. If she wants to meet a young guy, what is the indispensable article of clothing when she gets dressed up? It is her gloves. Her gloves that are going to conceal the red chapped hands of the working girl. Because when that young fella sees that pretty girl coming and he sees those red chapped hands, he's going to know that's a maid and I'm not going to waste my time on somebody who works six and a half days a week. Uh, but if Katie's wearing her gloves, Maybe she's going to meet that young fella and charm him and kind of reel him in a little bit before he figures out that, before she tells him that, that uh, she's a maid. Now, back at the house, the, the guests have their dinner. You know, it's all, all this elegance and luxury. But behind the scenes, the servants are working their tails off to make it possible. The dirty dishes go down to the scullery where they are washed by the scullery maids. In the scullery, you have the scullery maids, and in the scullery, you have the tears. That's where the tears were shed. I read two accounts of scullery maids in the Gilded Age, and uh, both accounts talked about the scullery maids crying. A butler writing about his time at a big house in the Gilded Age said, the scullery maids washed dishes all day, and after their hands were all chapped and red and starting to split open, they just kept washing. There's more and more dishes are coming all the time. And so he said it was common to walk by the scullery and see the maids there washing the dishes with tears running down their face. And then the other account I read of tears in, in the scullery was uh, a country girl got hired as a scullery maid and she arrives for her first day at work and she's standing at the sink and she begins to cry because she can't figure out how the water comes out of that pipe she'd never seen indoor plumbing before and she can't figure out how to turn on the tap. Well, after dinner, the guests go to the drawing room to chat and have drinks and maybe they'll play billiards and play cards. And then finally at the end of the night, 
they'll retire to bed. This is Mrs. Mill's fabulous bedroom at Statsburg. I think it's one of the great rooms in the Hudson Valley. And uh, I, I picked the picture from Vogue uh, on purpose. So Mrs. Mills goes to bed, and you can imagine the kitchen staff can finally clean up. The maids have got to be up very early so the maids can finally get to bed. Uh, but not the lady's maid, not Mrs. Mills' personal servant. She has got to help Mrs. Mills get undressed. And as Mrs. Mills takes off her fabulous gown and drops it to the floor, the lady's maid sweeps it up. And maybe Mrs. Mills spilled a little tomato sauce on the gown. Well, the lady's maid better get that stain out before it's fresh. So as Mrs. Mills goes to sleep, you know, the lady's maid is going to be taking that gown to a sink and trying to get that stain out before it sets. And then hanging up all the clothes and making sure it's all right. Long after Mrs. Mills is asleep, the lady's maid is still taking care of the clothes. So the lady's maid finally tucks Mrs. Mills into bed gathers up the clothes, takes care of them, and then the exhausted lady's maid can finally sink into a badly needed sleep. Unless, unless, oh, Mrs. Mills wakes up in the middle of the night, and oh, she can't get back to sleep, and I think I need a glass of warm milk. So all she has to do is reach to the head of her bed, and at the head of her bed, there are call buttons for servants. She doesn't even have to get out of bed. Servants hall, says the one on the left. Housekeeper, says the one in the middle. And the one on the right, says maid. She pushes the one on the maid, and that exhausted lady's maid, who has just fallen asleep, has got to get up from her attic room, run downstairs, See what Mrs. Mills wants. Oh dear, could you get me a glass of warm milk? Run down to the kitchen, heat up the milk, right? Bring her back upstairs, a glass of milk. Mrs. Mills has the milk. Thank you, dear. Yes, I think I can sleep now. And then the lady's maid can finally go to bed. Now, all of that said, I know I, I, I presented such an attractive picture of being a maid in the Gilded Age that perhaps some of you are thinking of quitting your job and uh, getting your resume out. Maybe you too would like to be a maid. You may be shocked to learn that early in the 20th century, right around the World War I years, the servants packed their bags. They turned their back on service. They walked away and they never came back. Well, what happened? A perfect storm of change in the years starting around 1914. Now, income tax says a perceptive person. Was that you? Yeah. Income tax is definitely one. In 1914, or 1917, uh, a permanent income tax was instituted in the United States to pay for World War I. That took a bite out of, out of the uh, Gilded Age millionaires. And I think the bottom line is, look, I'll clean your chamber pot if I can't get a better job. But the second I can get a better job, I'm out of here. And for women who needed to work in the 19th century and early 20th century, there were few opportunities. You know, you could work on a farm, or you could work in some terrible sweatshop, uh, or you could work in service, but you didn't have too many opportunities. But it starts to change early in the 20th century. And here is, here is a, a, a revolutionary engine of change, the typewriter. Once you have the typewriter, you have reams of paperwork. And women start to get hired into business offices as typists. You saw it in the first episode of Downton Abbey. A, a young maid gets a typewriter, and she leaves. And she comes back, like years later in the, in the series, as somebody who's middle class. Women break into the business world around the turn of the century as typists. Their great granddaughters maybe are the CEOs, but the pioneers are these women who start as typists. When the war comes, you can get a job as a nurse, and then maybe you don't go back into service. The men went off to fight the war. The women went into the factories. When the men came back, they kicked the women out. 
Oh, but these women, their daughters may be Rosie the Riveter in World War II, right? Rosie the Riveter goes back into the factory, and maybe Rosie the Riveter's granddaughter is CEO. But these are the pioneers who are, who are breaking through for the first time. Now, what else happens? You need a ton of laundry maids. <laughs> you start to have these labor-saving devices. And then, what do you need a whole crew of laundry maids for once you have a washing machine? You know, we saw the uh, vacuum cleaner earlier. Well, after a while, the ladies start to figure out that, hey, I can run this vacuum cleaner. Do I need a maid? And two or three generations later, the men figure out how to run the vacuum cleaner. Right? Now, <laughs> in, in case anybody missed it, the lady said, really? <laughs> in 1914, Henry Ford started to pay his, his assembly line workers $5 a day. It was a revolution. Other manufacturers tried to keep up with Henry Ford. A hundred years into the Industrial Revolution, you can finally make a middle class wage in a factory. And people leave service and they go into factories. And then, of course, there was the big one. 1929, the stock market crash, and so many great fortunes were lost. Uh, in the Gilded Age, they built these castles. This is one of the ones in Long Island. You know, with the idea that, like in Europe, these castles were going to last for hundreds of years, and most of them were gone in a generation. Here's our local example, the Jones's Mansion outside of Rhinecliff. Is that still there? It's still there as a shell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Did it? Yeah, I think uh, Eric's saying, didn't it just sell? And I think it did sell recently, and Lord knows what they're going to do. No. Oh, it didn't sell for much? Like yeah. Privately? Yeah, yeah, sold privately. But uh, yeah, it's just as I, I don't know if it'd be possible to do anything with the building itself. It's, as with anything, once the roof goes out, once the roof goes, you're, you're hard to save the rest of the building. Yeah, yeah, and I think the roof sold the one. I always get this wrong. Oh. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little outside of Ryan Cliff. And it's all fenced off, and I understand there's somebody who keeps an eye on it. I, you know, after we leave, on my way home, I'm going to remember the name. <laughs> yeah. Well, Katie. You know, um, there's, there's uh, one aspect of servant's life that I, I haven't addressed. And I've given you a, a, kind of a jaundiced idea of... Uh, the hard, the, of servant's life at the turn of the century. You know, but I want to be clear that it was a hard life. But there's one aspect uh, that I haven't addressed, and I, I'd like to finish with that. And that aspect is that when people live together, sometimes for generations, you know, for decades, they often develop a warm relationship with one another, even if they were employer and servant. And you did certainly see it in Downton Abbey, where you saw in this fictional story in Downton Abbey, this, this uh, genuine af affection. Now, I made up Katie as a fictional character. And I said, she, uh, in my imagination, she was hired by Catherine Harper, the Mills' Irish housekeeper. But Catherine Harper was a real person. And I want to finish with a story about Catherine Harper. Uh, Catherine Harper, when she was young, was herself a young Irish immigrant. And she was hired by Mrs. Mills' mother to be nanny for Ruth Mills and for Ruth Mills' twin sister. So um, Ruth Mills' nanny was Catherine Harper. And when Ruth Mills grew up and became a high-powered society hostess, who does she hire to be her housekeeper to make sure that when the elite of Gilded Age society comes. Everything in her house is perfect. She hires Catherine Harper, her nanny. So you can see just from that the regard in which 
Ruth Mills held Catherine Harper. And you can see the regard in which Catherine Harper held Ruth Mills in Catherine Harper's will. Catherine Harper died in 1901. And uh, she left a will in which she mentions the Millses. She left $100 to Ruth Mills' elderly mother, who is still alive. She said, as a token of my esteem and affection for her, and to make up for any shortcomings in my services to her. And Catherine Harper owned a house in the village of Statsburg. After a lifetime of working for the Millses, she had done well, and she owned a very nice house in Statsburg. And she left her house to her employer, Ruth Livingston Mills. And she said if the fabulously wealthy Ruth Mills didn't want the house, she should sell it. And with the proceeds, she should buy a piece of jewelry for Ruth and for Ruth's twin sister. And she says, at the end of the will, she says, and I ask that they accept the same as a memento of the love and devotion of their nana. And with that heartwarming note, I will end and ask if folks have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, the, the question is, how similar are these Hudson River mansions to the mansions in Newport? And, and there, there are certainly similarities, as many of the Hudson River folk did have summer mansions in Newport. The Millses had a summer place in Newport. Their neighbors, the Vanderbilts, had a summer place in Newport. Uh, the Millses' place in Newport was uh, older and not as lavish as places like uh, Marble House and the Breakers, uh, but it was on that same row of houses, you know. So you, you definitely see similarities. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I, I, I'll give you my card. And did I see that you guys had a map? I can. Okay, I, I can show you on that. I'd be happy to show you where it is. Yeah, good. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And I'm not running away. I'll be around for a while if any other questions come up. And thanks again.